Our next speaker will be Dr. Scott Schuler from Colorado State University. He will be talking about best practices with chip seals. So best practices with chip seals. So how many, uh, how many of you in here are agencies that do chip seal? Okay. And you, and you don't know how to do it? Is that why you're in this room today? <laughs> <laughs> I came hoping you were going to teach me how to do this. Um, actually, I'll, I'll plug a research project that we're working on. We just started a research project for NCHRP 1437, uh, which is going to produce a construction guideline for hot and cold chip seals and microsurfacing. Um, if any of you are maintenance people that actually do chip seals or have specs, um, I sent out a questionnaire about a week ago, and I've gotten seven replies from uh, 88 requests. So if any of you are, are not sending me back my questionnaire, leave now and send it. And you, we can talk about this later, all right? All right. All right, so best practices with chip seals. Let me, let me get into this thing. First, first thing we'll do is define what, what we're talking about. So took this picture back in 2005. We're going we're gonna to apply some emulsion to the, to the surface. And uh, this is not how we want to do it, right? So I like to show slides of how to do it and how not to do it all at the same time. And I'm not going to tell you which or which. So you have, to, you have to figure out whether I'm showing you the right way to do it or the wrong way to do it. This is not the right way to do it. Why? What's wrong with this application that we're doing right here? We're spraying emulsion on the surface, true. What's wrong with this, though? Uh, actually, the bar height is about right uh, for a double application of these of these nozzles. See how this see how this triangle comes down to about the midpoint of the bottom of that one comes down to about the midpoint of that. So we're actually getting double application, which is what we want. Three would be even better, but very seldom you see three. So two two is right, but the biggest problem here is all these nozzles are turned different directions. Okay, that's why there's that's why you see the drilling over here. So these. These, these first two are looking okay. That one's turned a little wrong. That's, that's wrong. Notice how all the triangles are not exactly the same, same triangle? That's because those nozzles are all cattywampus in that bar. They're not turned the same direction. All right? They need to be 15 to 30 degrees, depending on the truck. If it's an Etnire, they're, we're looking at 15 degrees. Bearcat's a little different. Roscoe's a little different. But that's the first thing you look at. So if you look at your bar and you can't see, you don't look and see all those triangles exactly the same, particularly these back here. Look how narrow those are. So those are, those are turned this way, and the one next to it's turned this way, and you can't get a uniform application. So don't do it this way, all right? All right. Next thing we do is drop some chips on it. That's just how that ought to look. I'll, get, I'll show you some other pictures of of uh, spreader boxes applying material, but you ought to be able to look at this from about this distance where I'm standing right here, and you ought to be able to, see, it ought to look very uniform all the way across, just by eye, right? First thing you do, for, by eye. If, if you can see any gaps in that, stop and fix it, right? And you know, you can calibrate it later, but the first thing you gotta do is just, just look at that. So there's the chips, and then the next thing we do is roll it how many rollers? I tell people you need four rollers, and everybody laughs. Ha, ha, ha. Well, here we are. We're actually, this is CDOT. We're actually doing this, Colorado DOT. Um, I mean, it's a contractor, but it's a contract chip seal. Um, if you put four rollers on like this, you'll be able to drive those rollers at less than three miles an hour and still get coverage and still get production. If you've only got two rollers out there, they can't keep up with the spreader box. And so they're going to be driving too fast. They're going to be doing five, six, seven miles an hour to try to keep up, and you're, and you're, you're done. You can't, you can't build a chip seal with rollers going five miles an hour. They've got to be going less than three. The only way you can do that, more rollers. So spec more rollers. Why is, it, why is the speed important? Speed's important because the faster that roller moves, uh, all, all part particulate materials that are compacted know how long the roller spends over a given point. Soil, concrete, asphalt, you name it, all, all do. It's the, only, it's the only construction we do where going slower gets you better production. 
You need, you need fewer passes of those rollers to get the same compaction if they go slow. If they go fast, you need more, more passes to get, to get and it's the same thing with, and there's been a whole bunch of studies done that uh, you could, you could, I could cite, but I can't remember what they are. I could look them up. What was the speed of that again? Three. It's a fast walk. So if you, if you can't keep up with that roller walking, it's going too fast. And every roller operator tries to drive fast because they think it's improving production. Yeah. They think they're doing a better job if they go fast, and it's never true. All right. So then we sweep it. This was taken a while back. And this is traffic control. <laughs> you know the sign that says, go slow? That, no, that's not traffic control, because they won't. This happens to be uh, Interstate 10 outside of Palm Springs, California. It's an 80,000 ADT interstate highway. And we built this chip seal out there to prove that you could put a chip seal on that high a traffic or road and not break any windshields. Um, this is what it took to get the cars to slow down. So, I mean, that was part of the experiment. We were trying to figure out, you know, can you, can you run a couple of tandems with a sign behind it and, and have the public follow the tandems? No, they go around the tandems in the median with that kind of traffic volume. Yeah, I learned something about traffic that, that, on that project. So any questions? That's, that's chip seals. On your rollers, is it going multiple passes on your, on your chip seal? Yes, is, are the rollers doing multiple passes? Yes. How many? Depends on the size of the chip, what kind of binder you have, the weather that day, whether the wind's blowing, how cold it is, all of those, the moisture in the chips all that. But the one constant is the speed. If you slow the rollers down, believe me, you can get, um, to, to use one of Donald's phrases, believe me, um, <laughs> you, you, you'll get better embedment. And the, the, the other thing is when a roller is moving too fast over those chips, there's a tendency for it to try to, that inertia will try to pick the, the chip up and roll it over. And then, it, and then you get pickup, and you get all kinds of other issues, too. So slowing the rollers down fixes a whole bunch of ills. There are lots of steps involved in chip sealing, yeah? I mean, this, this looks like a real simple application. You know, we're just going to spray asphalt emulsion or hot asphalt cement on the road and drop chips in it, roll it a little bit, turn it over to traffic. You know, how hard can this be? Um, at the end of the day, we've got a, a lot of stuff to, to figure out. We've got to pick the right pavement pick the right materials. Uh, here's, here's one that we don't do very often. Design the quantities, never do that. Uh, it, calibrate the equipment. I don't know how many projects I've been on and nobody has any idea how much asphalt emulsion or cement they're shooting. Don't, no clue. Think they do, but they don't. Um, construction, weather, prep, you know, surface, all this stuff. All right? And then quality control. Do you, do, do you actually do sieve analysis on your chips? Do you know what the, what the chip gradation is? Is it the same truck to truck? That's, that's really a big one. Um, if you get everything dialed in with the first couple of trucks and then the next truck shows up and it's different material, you're done. You, know, you, can't, you can't be changing material during the course of the project. So anyway, well, in their bed and depth, that's, there's, your, there's, your, there's your answer to your question right there. See? Just kidding. It's coming up. So aggregate. We want crushed, two mechanically fractured faces. This thing shows uh, big, uh, no, none, none of this. You know, what do I got here? It's got river gravel. However, I'll say this quietly, because Gale House gets mad at me when I say that you can use marginal aggregate in chip seals. You can. You can use this aggregate in chip seals, even though it says you can't. And when? Low volume. Low volume roads. If you've, got, if you've got traffic under 580T, you can get by with some pretty crappy marginal aggregate. We did a study for CDOT to prove it, because they've got, uh, Colorado's got a lot of really nasty uh, river gravels out east, eastern part of the state, away from the mountains. Uh, they can't afford to bring in front range crushed stone from the quarries to build chip seals. Just can't afford it. You know, it's low volume material. And so we, we did some marginal aggregate chip seals out there, and it works great. As long as the traffic's not very high, uh, you can make it work. I didn't say you can use this on the interstate with 80,000 vehicles per day. That, that won't work. So this is what you use on the interstate. Not probably that big. That's a 988 tire right there. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, that's maybe a little coarse. Uh, we, have done, we have done one inch chip seals though. One inch stone chip seals. It can be done. It takes a gallon per square yard to hold it down. Um, 
low LA loss naturally. Uh, what should the LA loss be? Probably numbers uh, in the under 30 range. You know, again, depending on traffic, if you've got low volume roads, uh, LA loss could be pretty high. Uh, so it just depends. So what I'm showing here are, these are all the things you need to do if you're gonna put it out there on your 85,000 ADT kind of road. No flat or elongated. This is particularly important. Um, and uh, the flakiness index test is the way to, to measure that. I know it's a pain in the butt to run the test, but you know it's you can do it. It doesn't take very long. Um, one or two sized material is best, and then clean. This this is probably uh, you know it says no no minus two hundred. You can get by with probably two or three percent dust minus two hundred. And if you formulate the emulsions correctly, you can deal with a certain amount of minus two hundred. Um, the thing I don't like to see is too much minus four. I'd, I'd almost rather deal with the dust than material passing the number four screen. That's a little harder to deal with. You can still do it, but it's, it's, it's trickier. So, you know, not this, obviously. This is a, inside of a spreader box. Um, and then the chips ought to be damp. So here's the dry chips. There's what it looks like when it's damp. And I mean damp, not soaking wet, not glossy, you know, with water running off of it. Um, you can still build a chip seal with that, but it just makes things tougher. So damp is better. Um, what else? Design it. So figure out how much chip you need for one stone thick. Not hard to do. Very simple process. How much emulsion? It's just a calculation. Also very simple. Uh, go through this exercise. Make sure the substrate that you're putting it on is uh, adequate for a chip seal, not too soft. You don't want the chips embedding in the, into a flushed uh, wheel path. Otherwise, you're going to end up with more flushing in your new chip seal. So um, let's see, what else? Spread rate, one stone thick. So let me show you this. So here, I got some animation that took me hours and hours to do. So I, <laughs> I hope, hope you appreciate this. <laughs> So one stone thick, see all the pentagons there? All of one, that's a nice shape too. The problem is, I don't know how many projects I've been on where we put it down an uh, inch and a half thick, right, for a 3 8 stone, inch and a half thick. That's better, inch and a half. Put lots of rock on, why? Well, it doesn't pick up, that's for sure. Uh huh. And then the idea is, it, it seems logical. It seems like if you, if you just pile it up on here, those rubber tire rollers won't pick up those stones and every, life will be good, yeah? And then what you do is these are all stuck, stuck and then you just sweep that all off. I went to a project, and I won't say what state it was in, and they were, they were uh, purportedly the best chip seal place in the state and they were putting it down an inch and a half thick, 3 8 stone, sweeping all this wonderful looking granite into the ditch. And I thought, holy cow, you know, I mean, we'd, we would kill for this aggregate. And these guys are just throwing it away. The problem is, when you put, when you put it on too thick, what's that do? Now, when you drop it, this isn't going to get swept off. Some of these are going to stay in there. You can't get them all off, yeah? And then traffic comes along and pushes on that, and then you lose three stones. So don't do that, okay? Because now you've got a flush chip seal. It's the best way to build a flush chip seal there is. Too much rock. Seems like the opposite would be true. It's not. It that's always happens. So you got to get the stone, and, and I'm going to show you how you know. And you'd like the initial bedment to be about 40 percent, and then the rollers will embed that some more, and traffic will embed it more. And you'd like to get it up to about 75 or 80 percent by the time you're all done, and it, and then it'll stay that way. It won't. It won't get any any worse. So here's a here's a picture of what it should look like before it's rolled. So this is right after the box goes by. Notice, I don't know if I've got this pointed out or not, let me back up. Notice all the black or brown holes. You, you should see that. Right after the box goes by, if you don't see a whole bunch of voids, it's too heavy. You should, you should look at it and think there's not enough stone. That's the first thought you go through your mind. You look at it and go, you know, it looks a little light. It's probably just right, just like that. Now you don't want it, you know, you don't want it too light. That's why it takes some judgment. You gotta, you kind of, kind of have to do this so you know what to look for. But, you know, I see, I, I see a lot of brown in here, and that's just how it ought to look. 
rollers come by and they're going to move those all into the place where they belong. You got it one stone thick with maybe 5% more than you really need just to make sure it doesn't pick up too bad because it could. So you want a little extra that you can broom off, but not an inch and a half thick. Okay. Getting it one stone thick, how do we do it? Do a board test. This is really, really sophisticated now. Okay. This, and this, takes, this costs a lot, this apparatus. You need a, like a half, half square yard sheet of OSB, or if you're really fancy, plywood. <laughs> Nail some one by two to the outside so it's got a little bit of a lip, and put your stones on there, push them on so they fit one stone thick, and weigh it. So you need, a, you need something to weigh with, and you need some OSB. A couple of nails and some one by two. And then, you know, an intern to run the test, because it takes about 40 minutes to run this test, weigh it. All right, that's your aggregate rate. Now you know the aggregate rate. Once you know the aggregate rate, you can calculate the emulsion. That's easy. We know about how much embedment we want. We know what the unit weights of the stones are in a specific gravity. We can calculate the voids volume, fill that up with asphalt to a certain place. It's just a calculation, real simple. So thick enough, not too thick, fast setting, not too fast, sticky. Bed ships about 30 to 50, traffic embeds to 75. Substrate too soft. Here's a, here's a test that the South Africans came up with, which actually works pretty well. I don't know how many of you do this. Anybody do this? I know. I know I'm, I'm probably the only one that's ever, this was actually done in the national parks. This is, uh, this is up at, uh, uh, in Moab, um, where we had a test section. Uh, this is just a uh, ball bearing, We've got a little jig here, and we take a Marshall hammer, it's a four inch diameter inside diameter, and we put a Marshall hammer on that and drop the hammer on that ball. So again, really sophisticated. And then measure with a you know, tool that we bought at the, local store to see how much embedment. And there's a whole criteria for determining whether this is too soft a substrate to chip seal or not. And there's a lot of experience behind it too. So I, you know, if you can't tell just by looking at it, because a lot of people have enough experience and they can say, you know, this, is, this isn't going to be a good pavement, but that's a, that's a good, decent way to uh, figure it out quantitatively. And then the spray rate is just a calculation. Like I said, you need to know the unit weight, uh, unit weight of water, of course, specific gravity of the stone. Then we got a traffic factor that we put in because we make adjustments to the spray rate based on how much traffic, um, and and also the the um, let me show you so surface condition correction. So this is that business of you know how soft is it. So we might take away some some binder if we've got a very soft substrate. Um, okay. All of this information, by the way, is in NCHRP report 680, 680 if you haven't. Get, get 680. Read, read report 680. I'm not going to go back. <laughs> I want you to read 680. If you thought you were going to learn it all today in 30 minutes, it isn't happening. All right? there's, there's, more, there's more to it. No, I'll, I'll go back here. See? <laughs> So I'm not showing you how you get the average mat depth, though, so that's, you have to call me. I, I make my living as a consultant, so this, this, this professor gig is just a part-time job I have. <laughs> I get a chance to do this every day. This is great fun. So dry, no rain threatening, pavement dry. I say this, and then I was reminded uh, yesterday about the test section that we built in Forks, Washington. Anybody from Washington State? Yeah? Tell them what Forks, Washington's weather is like. It's not bad. 200, inches 200 inches a year. 200 inches a year, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it basically rains every day, right? It, it, mist, it mists. So I show up, and I'm, you know, I'm the smartest guy in town, right? I'm going to build this chip seal and for NCHRP, and it's an experiment. And we're trying to show how to do this in, under various conditions. You know, showing that you need dry, no rain threatening, pavement dry, blah, blah, blah. We get to Forks, Washington, and it's misting rain. It's the place where they film the uh, uh, vampire movies, because it's overcast there all the time. I mean, the, 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 the suicide rate must be off the charts. <laughs> Anyway, so I said, so uh, when's this weather going to break so that we can build this experiment? You know, and the, pr the project manager says, what are you talking about? This is, 
fantastic day, you know, and it's just, <laughs> and it's just drizzling, you know, the whole time. And, and so at the end of the day, you can, you can formulate your emulsions for those kinds of conditions, even, even when it's raining. But, you know, but you gotta, you gotta design the material according to the conditions you have. Low wind's a good idea, otherwise you get, this, you get the emulsion on all the public's cars and they don't like that, and you get phone calls. Uh, 60 to 90. You start getting, you know, low temperature, everybody kind of understands. You get up to real high temperatures above 90, 95F, and some emulsions will skin over. Um, and, and so you can formulate emulsions uh, to have considerably lower demulsibility sometimes and deal with really high temperatures, like the Palm Springs uh, project that we had. It was 100 degrees there every day. But it's, it's not recommended. It's another one of these things that you kind of, you know, take some playing around to make it. And then texture, uh, uh, best, best thing, we've looked at everything for determining texture from just looking at it, if you've got experience, to sand patch tests, to laser beams, uh, to, you know, you name it. And uh, this, this t t tends to be the best way to do it. It's low tech, doesn't take any time. Uh, you can you spread out your you know you know 25 milliliters of sand out of a sand in a circle very quickly with a squeegee measure the diameter and poof you got a, and a formula tells you the how much how much surface texture you have very simple quick and dirty doesn't require any um, fancy equipment all right let's quit I gotta I gotta go um, let's talk about calibrating equipment because this is one of the things that really I, I really can't stress enough. Um, we, we went out to uh, all these different pieces of equipment. You can see we, uh, CDOT's got some really sophisticated gear. This is probably a 1957 model uh, Roscoe distributor. Uh, for those of you that haven't been around older equipment, most of the equipment you see will be computer controlled Bearcats and Etnires. Uh, this is a modern Roscoe. This, this thing, uh, you got an operator on the back and he's got a lever. And as, he, as they drive that truck down the road, he pulls that lever back, and that opens the nozzles. So he, lo he looks back there, and he pulls that lever, and then he looks at it, and, oh, a little too much, oh, push it, oh, you know. The, this, the bitumeter on this hadn't worked for like 50 years, so the, the speed of the truck kind of, you know, you just kind of wing it. And, uh, but you know what? These guys get, they do good work. I mean, it's very touchy-feely. Uh, and for that kind of gear, you gotta, you, you've got to have experience. With, and, and you need it with this equipment too, but, um, it, it, but it's, it's a little less, this is what we want, not really, almost. So the first thing we do, take the temperature of the stuff. This is a little too low. That's reading 110 degrees Fahrenheit. It ought to be reading 170 Fahrenheit, 180-ish, not 110. That means the material's too high of viscosity. Uh, that truck's going to have a hard time spraying that uniformly, unless you put a much bigger nozzle in than, than is in there. And changing out 36 nozzles is not so easy, so, and you probably don't, so it's just too cold. So that's too cold. Measure the viscosity. Uh, Wyoming DOT came up with this. So. The emulsion shows up, you pump it into your distributor. Anybody ever determine whether or not it's the stuff you bought or not? No. Just assume it is, right? Uh, where'd it come from? Did, you know, did you drive it 75 miles before it got to your distributor truck? Maybe. Over the mountains, bumpy roads? All of that has an effect on the emulsion. Emulsions are inherently unstable. So when the stuff shows up on the site, and this, was, this happened to be over in Moab too when we were doing this research, uh, testing this idea. So this little box just keeps the wind off. This is just a, a Wagner paint cup viscometer. You dip it in the five gallon can that you got your sample out of the, out of the spray bar and let her drop. Measure how long it takes for that material to fall in there. And you get a, you get a real rough and, and tumble idea about whether or not you got the right emulsion or not. This is not a specification test. You're not going to accept material or reject material based on it probably because temperature control is a little bit of an issue under these conditions. But at least you've got an idea of whether or not the stuff is all gloppy or whether or not it's actually going to work. Gives you some clue, right? And we've got a, then there's some criteria, a little bit of criteria here depending on the size of the orifice. What's the nozzle? Uh, 
pick, you know, here's Etnar's uh, spray bar nozzle chart. Just look, if this comes with every truck, get in there and figure out whether or not you got the right nozzles in the bar or not. Because some of these nozzles are way too small, some of them are way too big. So use the right one. Roscoe's got this placarded right on their truck. So you just, you know, for you know, double knot all the way to a number three, shows you roughly what the application rate should be in gallons per square yard. This is what these nozzles look like if you've never, if you've never pulled these out of a bar. They come in all kinds of different shapes and sizes from uh, coin slots to you know, really wide uh, nozzles. Where do they go? They go in here. Now, here's where they are. This is with the wing up. And notice the angle. So this is, this is in a contractor's Bearcat. You know, this is a $130,000 piece of equipment, all computer controlled, very modern, and all the nozzles in there are wrong. That's, that's not right. Looks like they're right. They're all lined up. At least they're all going the same direction. Yeah. There's a wrench. Every one of these trucks comes with this wrench. See this thing? It's got a, it's got a, a, a there's a, a wire welded in this thing. So when you turn this wrench parallel to the bar, it turns the nozzle at 15 to 30 degrees for that truck and that bar. And I don't know how many operators I've talked, I've taught how to use that wrench. I'm a college professor. I shouldn't have to teach an operator how to set up their truck. And I don't know how many jobs I've been on where, what wrench? You know, they go over to the toolbox and, and they pull out a crescent wrench. I go, yes, that is a wrench. It's not the one I'm talking about. That's the wrench you need. Oh, that's what that's for. Yes. <laughs> you know, it's, it's nice to be needed. So, <laughs> so here we are. And in this case, uh, we probably ought to have an, an end nozzle on here, right? This is, a, this is an intermediate no nozzle. And so we're spraying this. Bar's probably too high as well. But we're spraying this, and notice how we got this edge. This does not have double application, right? You want an edge nozzle there, an end nozzle that gives you the, the right application. All nozzles should be equal, not like that. These are all turned different dire directions. See how the triangles are all different shapes? So it's easy to see. You don't have to wait till the, you see the drilling. This is a little high. Is that, is that an end nozzle or you just turn it perpendicular? No, it's an end nozzle. It's, uh, it's made not to give you a triangle. It's made to, well, it's, it's made not to give you an equilateral triangle. It's made to give you an isosceles triangle with the center cut at a, at a vertical. Yeah. Yeah, if you turn it, you're gonna get a lot more material there than you really want. Yeah. So a little, little high on this one. This happens to be a tack coat, but I, you know, I showed it just so you can see what a too high looks like. Overlap, the, these should overlap on a, at least double, where in, the, in this case they're not, even for a tack coat. So if the bar is too high, you get streaks. If the bar is too low, you get the same result. It's similar like this. Actually, that's not a bad looking tack coat. It's not, it's not awful, let's put it that way. Spraying the correct rate. Um, how do we know if we're spraying the right rate? So on the back of these trucks, there's sometimes on the front, there's a gauge, right? Got this big needle gauge. That's not what you use. This is to tell you whether the truck's empty or not. That's about it. I know it's got gallon marks on it, and it's really accurate. No. And I don't know how many times that's what, you know, did you calibrate your truck? Yep. Okay. How'd you do it? Did you use the gauge? Yep. What about the dipstick? What dipstick? The dipstick. The one, the one up on top of your truck. Oh, is that what that's for? Ah, oh, jeez. So, these dipsticks, it seems easy, right? What do you do? You just go up on, get up on top, put the dipstick down in the tank, measure how much, you know, just like your car, measuring the oil in your car. Yeah, turns out it's not that easy. Atnar's dipstick is different than Roscoe's dipstick, naturally. Here's an Atnar. Zero gallons is at the top, not the bottom. So you don't dip this in the oil. You just touch it to the top of the oil, and you read how much volume is in the tank off the top of the manhole. 
I don't know how many Etnars I've seen where the dipstick is all coated with asphalt. You can't read it, right? Because all, you know. And the, oh yeah, yeah, we use the dipstick. Oh yeah, let me see it. You go up on top of the truck and look at it. It's coated. You know, it's got a half inch thick asphalt on it, right? Residue. And they go, oh, that's that's nice. How do how do you how do you know how much asphalt you got in your truck? Well, what do you mean? You dip that down in there, and you can see how much you got. I said, no, that's not how you're. This oh, okay. Roscoe's, you do. Roscoe's got a different philosophy. They say this is stupid. Bob Ednar is an idiot. You know, he didn't know how to design a truck. <laughs> so they got a different opinion. With the Roscoe, you actually do stick the dipstick down in the in the material. And actually, they've they've got there's something to that because if you've ever done this, you know that when the truck gets a little bit low on 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 asphalt figuring out where the top of that black asphalt is down there in that black hole so that you don't stick the dipstick in it, it's not so easy. You know, you almost need a big light and you shine down in there. Um, all right, so here we go. Start and stop on paper. I gotta go. This contractor, this happened to be out in California. Contractor is, is starting and making his joints on paper like he should. Unfortunately, all the nozzles are turned the wrong direction. So he's got, he's got one thing right, <laughs> and this, this works fantastic. If you don't do this, do it. This, this makes perfect joints. And the other thing it does is it gets everybody involved in the process, which I like. It makes it so it doesn't seem like such a poor man's construction process anymore. So this just gets everybody involved, and it requires an extra person. Is the spreader calibrated? How even is the veil? Look how even that veil is, isn't that nice? That's the way it ought to look, just like that. You ought to be able to see nice, even light all the way through. You can tell every single gate is, is set just right. And how much, how much are you spreading? Well, there's a test. There's an ASTM test. I was a co-author of it. I don't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> it was many years ago when I was young and foolish and didn't know what I was doing. Um, and I liked writing specs for ASTM. Um, I'd fill this box up with a truck, drive that box down the road, measure how far you go, how much you, how much you uh, applied, do a calculation based on that, much more accurate. The ASTM test is, looks like a good test, but you use small little pads, try to weigh these small little pads, you miss one or two rocks and the error it gets pretty awful. This way, uh, you, you've got a nice average. You get a pretty, pretty good idea of how much material you're applying. And then if you just look at the veil, you can see that it's nice and uniform. And I'm gonna, I gotta get going, I know. So just measure the distance and the width. This, is, uh, this happens to be CDOT. I'm gonna show some, and they've seen these slides already. They already know some of the things they're doing wrong. How many rollers, we already showed you four. Do that, make sure they're rubber. Some agencies are using steel uh, rollers on their chip seals. Don't do that. Don't use steel. No, no, no. I'll, we, at grad, in grad school chip seals, we can talk about steel, but we're not, this is, inter, this is beginning chip seals today, okay? There are some conditions where steel roller can work. Don't use them. Okay, come see me if you wanna talk about steel rollers. We've, we've had some success, but as a rule, it's not a good idea. Um, it, it breaks the chip, and uh, the chips actually, if, if they're hard enough chips, they'll hold the roller up off the chip, and you won't get compaction around those chips. So it's just, there's, there's some reasons why you might wanna do that, but I wouldn't do it. When do we sweep? Well, oh, whoops. Oh, this, yeah, I wanna show you this. So there's a lab test to figure out um, how soon you can sweep. And one of the ways you tell that is how much moisture is still left in your chip seal. The moisture content of the chip seal is directly related to when you can turn it loose to traffic. Make sense? I know. We, <laughs> we had a, this project, NCHRP Report 680, uh, was designed, uh, when we did this work, uh, I bid this work and got it, and you know, and we, it's nice getting this stuff because it's like, ah, I got one, and then you go, oh crap, now I gotta do it. I gotta do all that stuff I said I could do. Geez, I wonder if I actually can. One of the things was figuring out when you, when you should broom and turn a chip seal over to traffic. And so we had this whole huge experiment design uh, laid out to try to figure it out. And one day I was in the lab working with my grad student who came up with this test. This is a modification of the ASTM procedure. Um, and and you know, it just hit me that 
there's so many variables involved in determining when you turn traffic loose on a chip seal, you almost can't design an experiment to do it in a lab. There's, it's, it's a factorial experiment that has like 97,000 cells in it. Um, and I thought, you know, moisture might have something to do with that. Eureka. And so we measured the moisture content in these chip seals in the laboratory to figure out when this thing would damage them and when it wouldn't. And it turns out at about 85% moisture loss. When, you, when, when the chip seal loses 85% of its moisture, it, it has, the emulsion has enough adhesivity that you won't lose very many rocks. It's you know, between 80 and 90%. So all you got to do is measure the moisture content in the field, and you can figure out when to put this thing on there. And then you got to be careful and make sure whoever's driving that is skilled, because this thing can just remove those chips real easy. Even this, even that old guy. So easy pressure, nylon, not the steel. Uh, before traffic, and then when moisture is less than 85 percent. Pilot car, really important. If uh, the traffic is light like this, they'll follow him. If, like I said before, if the traffic's very heavy, they'll just go around him. And traffic people all know that, but us materials people never did. Um, there's the cop car again. So 15 to 25 miles an hour. This traffic actually can uh, benefit your chip seal. So I like, I like running traffic on a chip seal just right, right after the first broom and then put the, put the traffic on slow, 15 to 25 is all, and the traffic helps compact it a bit. And as long as you can keep the speed down, you won't break any windshields. And then just a few tips and I'm gonna get out of here. So see the light showing through? See how it's not uniform? It's almost uniform. It's not awful, but it ought to be exactly the same all the way across. See how it's a little darker there and a little lighter? So there, probably there's some nozzle uh, blockage or maybe the nozzles aren't turned exactly right. So a lot of this stuff, you can just see it. You know, you don't have to do a lot of science. You don't have to do a lot of measurements. You just kind of look at it. Nice veil, but they did that. See, they got that right, but you know, don't overload it because now you got piles of material like that that these guys are, now they gotta sweep that off. So, you know, so they got most of this right. You know, there's just a few things. CDOT, this is CDOT, and they hired me to, to critique them. So, you know, so I'm not, not making fun of them. They, they, they wanted to find this stuff out. Uh, and so we, we've been helping with a lot of the crews go around and fix a lot of this stuff. So, and then edge nozzle, see there's, See, there's an example of not having an edge nozzle. The, the theory here, of course, is that when you go back and do the other side, it's gonna, it, you're going you're gonna to double that up on the center line, and you'll have the correct rate. The trouble is that's set by that time. So the chips you're trying to embed in the new material are being embedded in half the rate, and you'll lose them. And that's the reason why you see that center line uh, chip loss. So that's it. Um, question was, is anybody using performance-based specifications for chip seals instead of uh, method specs? Um, not that I'm aware of, but I'd sure like to know if anybody is. Is, is anybody in here doing anything like that? Using a performance base? In other words, just stick the chips and we'll pay you? Um, from New Zealand? Oh, how, yeah, how are we measuring moisture loss? Uh, we, had a, uh, we had a really sophisticated uh, method of doing that. We, uh, we knew how much moisture, we estimated the amount of moisture on the, on the pavement before, it was, before the chip seal was applied. Uh, we measured the moisture content in the chips. That's, that was easy enough. We know the moisture content in the emulsion because we know 67% you know, uh, residue pretty much. Um, and so before the distributor comes by, put a, put a weighed board, again, some OSB or something on the, on the ground. We started out with one square yard. That's too big. It's too, too big and heavy. And half a square yard is plenty, plenty big. Just pre-weigh that. Distributor runs over that. Chips run over that. Pull it off and weigh it. Put it on a, we just had an old house triple beam balance and it wasn't even electronic. Set it on the balance. You know based on the moisture that's in the emulsion and the chip, and estimated on the, on the pavement surface roughly how much water is in there. So now all you got to do is wait until that balance weighs a certain amount and you've got your percentage. It's, it's a little bit clumsy, 
but if you and you don't have to do it very much you know if you're if your site at your chip ceiling doesn't vary too much in terms of climate in terms of wind in terms of other things that can affect that that set rate you only have to really only have to do that once because then you know roughly how long it takes to get to the 85 percent for example in forks washington it took 14 hours <laughs> but yeah but at arches national park it took an hour and a half so that's the reason why when we did the nchrp project one of the things i was having a problem with initially was how are we going to be able to tell an agency or a person doing chip seal how long before they can broom it because that's what everybody asks how long before i can broom it the answer is 85 percent moisture loss not time because the time varies depending on whether you're in a rainstorm or whether you're out in the desert all right thank you dr schuler we need to move on to our next speaker